Hi everybody, welcome back to English 116. This is for our class for Monday, the 25th. And I hope you had a very good spring break. And what we are doing is transitioning from Oedipus the King, the first play in our drama section, to the second play in our drama section, which happens to be A Midsummer Night's Dream. So I hope that you were able to begin reading A Midsummer Night's Dream, but I wanted to be able to give you some background information about Shakespeare and also talk a little bit about production. Um, as you know, watching a performance is never a substitute for reading the play. It's a supplement for reading the play. In terms of paper number one, I am in the midst of evaluating some of those papers. So some of you should have received paper number one back and some of you are probably still waiting for its return. And the idea behind paper number one is that you were responding to our fiction section. So you were either talking about film or you were talking about short story. And I evaluated those and am evaluating those for grammar and mechanics and content. And then what I do is I return that back to you with a letter grade, A being excellent, B being good, C being satisfactory. And yes, there is a less than satisfactory, which is a D and an F and unsatisfactory as well. And if you are content with your grades, well, then you're done with the exercise. And if you wanted a little bit more information about the distinction between an A or a B or a C, there is a grading criteria um, a page on our or in our class syllabus and course outline that talks about some of the distinctions between excellent and good and satisfactory. Everybody, however, has the option of doing a revision. Um, and the idea behind the revision is that this is really how professional authors write, is that they get feedback and then they make changes. So you do have the option of writing a revision for a higher grade. You need to incorporate my comments into your revision. And if you're not sure how to proceed, certainly reach out to me. And I wouldn't at all be surprised if you had some difficulties reading my handwriting. So if that happens to be the case, definitely reach out to me and then I can translate some of my handwriting for you. And regardless of whether or not you decide to write a revision, do read my comments very carefully. Um, I spent a good amount of time on them and this is really the best way to learn how to write is by paying attention to the comments that I've made to the writing that you yourself have created. If you were to do a revision, I ask that you submit in the original paper with my comments um, along with your revision, and then you would get the higher of the two grades. And you have up until the ending of the semester to do that, but the sooner the better, obviously, for everybody involved. And where we are is talking about drama because eventually we will finish our drama section and this will be your second paper where you will have the same topics and I will distribute um, again those topics to you, but the same topics that you had for short story about whether or not you wanted to talk about a drama or a performance of a drama that you thought should or should not be included in the literary canon and your reasoning why, or whether or not you wanted to talk about a drama or a performance of a drama that you thought still has contemporary relevance, and why, or why not. Or you could create your own essay topic. You just need to get that topic approved by me. And that paper would be due at the very ending of the semester, so you wouldn't have a chance to rewrite. But the idea is that you would have learned how to write a paper with the first paper. So you're just repeating the exercise with the drama section, but your focus in this instance happens to be on drama rather than on short story. And, or in this instance, Citizen King. And then finally, we end the semester with poetry. Not enough time to write a paper about poetry, but enough time to have a final exam that is focused on poetry, which we'll talk some more about when we get to the poetry section. But in terms of Shakespeare, I wanted to give you a little bit of background information to prepare you for A Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, you probably know that I teach a Shakespeare class as well. And I'm well aware that this is not a Shakespeare class. It's an introduction to literature and film class. So 
The idea behind this introduction is just to give you some surface level information. And when we get to the play in Midsummer Night's Dream, also again, we won't necessarily have the same expectations that we would have in a Shakespeare class in terms of understanding. One of the things I want to make sure is that you are very clear with the plot. Not that the audience would have known the plot ahead of time the way they did with Oedipus the King, but nevertheless, I know that Shakespeare leads to some challenges. So that said, I thought it would be um, useful for us to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of plot. After reading the play and watching a performance, and as you know, um, watching a performance performance is never a substitute for reading the play. It's merely a supplement. I think what you'll find is you'll have a good understanding of the play. But in order to understand the play, you probably want to know a little bit about Shakespearean background. And surprisingly, we know very little about Shakespeare compared to other people during his time period. And as a result of that, there have been a lot of conspiracy theories that you may or may not have heard of called the authorship question. Did Shakespeare actually exist? And if so, did Shakespeare actually write these plays, considering how little information we have about them? The, the short answer is that most scholars believe that, yes, there was a Shakespeare who wrote these plays. I, too, believe that as well. I think many of the arguments are somewhat classist because many of the arguments uh, center around the idea that Shakespeare never went to university, only grammar school. But Shakespeare in grammar school would have learned Latin and Greek, so it was a very different kind of grammar school. The documentation we do have about Shakespeare is mostly based on legal records, things like birth certificates and death certificates. So according to his birth certificate, he was born in 1564. According to his death certificate, he was um, he passed away on 1616, both on April 23rd, which is possible. I, I know somewhat unusual, but possible in Stratford-upon-Avon. And depending on the scholarship you read, Stratford-upon-Avon was really a center of trade. So Shakespeare would have met a lot of people or it was in the middle of nowhere, and then how could Shakespeare have the knowledge that he has of all these different kinds of individuals in different stations? Um, we do know that um, Shakespeare ended up marrying Young, um, and then six months after his marriage, he had his first child. So do the math. You can probably assume what happened then. Um, we don't even know how Shakespeare died, uh, some conjecture about a fever, for instance. But again, lots of question marks. And usually what we end up doing is that acknowledging that while we know so little about the man, at least we have his writings. But surprisingly, the writings themselves also have lots of question marks associated with them. Um, and the reason why is because writing at the time was not copyrighted in the way that we do today. So that said, the plays were not preserved in the way that we would expect them to be preserved. That's not to say that people couldn't get written copies of the play. They did all the time. And in fact, these were, I guess for lack of a better word, bootleg versions of the plays where you would either hire someone to sit in the audience and transcribe everything that they heard and saw. Can you imagine the number of errors that would appear? Or to hire one of the actors in the play, probably somebody who needed money, probably a bit actor, to reconstruct the play. That also probably had errors. Um, usually actors learn their roles well and not the other roles very well. And certainly a bit actor might want to reimagine his role as being a little bit more grandiose. Now, all of these versions, and they were all different kinds that existed, um, you can almost think of them like bootleg DVDs, if, if you remember the time when people would sell bootleg DVDs um, on street corners. Um, but basically, all of these were known as quartos, which is a printing term, which basically means that you take a sheet of paper and you fold it into fourths. Quarto means cuatro or four. So that it looked like a small paperback book. So basically, if you had a sheet of paper like so, you would fold it once and then again. So it would be something smaller. And there would be lots of different versions of these quartos for each of the plays. What's unusual about Shakespeare, and it's usually used as a piece of proof that Shakespeare did exist, is that seven years after Shakespeare's death, so Shakespeare isn't around at this point, his peers got together to try to put together a definitive version of his plays. It had never been done before. 
And of course, Shakespeare wasn't there to verify, but they tried to the best of their ability. And this is known as the folio, which is also another printing term where you take a large sheet of paper, but in this instance, you fold it just once rather than twice, so it's much larger. So going to contemporary times, we have editors. And what editors do is they go through all of the different versions that exist of a particular play, all of the quartos that might exist, as well as the folio. And they compare and contrast them to one another to try to come up with the definitive text. Some of the plays, it's less obvious than others. Um, and those plays are known as problem plays because there's a lot of textual corruption and a lot of questions. You don't usually study those at the collegiate level. But there are plays that are considered to be clean plays that usually have little or no dispute. And A Midsummer Night's Dream is definitely one of those particular plays. That's not to say that there is absolutely no dispute. Note that occasionally you might be reading a play and see within the dialogue a square bracket. And if you'll remember, a square bracket is a convention that we use within quotation to indicate that we are inserting our own language. So if you see square brackets in a Shakespearean play, that means this is the editor's insertion of their best guess of the word that would be in there based on rhyme and meter and content and so forth. And language was being created during Shakespeare's time. There wasn't a standardized dictionary. Individuals oftentimes created language and then that language was never used again or the language became part of the common uh, vocabulary and vernacular of the time. But Shakespeare oftentimes created language and some of that language was never used again. So occasionally what you'll have is an editor trying to define language for you because language would have been used differently during Shakespeare's time. And um, what a word meant during Shakespeare's time might mean something very different during our time. Occasionally, an editor whose job is to try to guess which words the average reader would need to be defined. That's an inexact science. Occasionally, an editor will give a definition for a word with a question mark, and that means that's the editor's best guess as to what that word means. So I tell you all of this because I know that the pressure for reading a Shakespearean play is to understand every single word. And I suggest that even the scholars and the literary critics can't do that. So try to get an overall sense of the plays. Certainly, they're much less problematic than when reading a Greek drama because we're reading a translation. And of course, with the Shakespearean plays, we're reading them in the original English. It's an English that's about 90% like our English. Um, so I liken it to knowing a foreign language that you know 90% of. But there's still changes. There's still variables there. So... As you are reading Renaissance English, some of the things that you might note is that you will see a mixture in Shakespearean plays of poetry, which is known as verse, or prose, which is complete sentences. And oftentimes Shakespeare would use language to indicate things like a character station or their ability to reason. So poetry or verse was considered a higher order language that characters would speak in. And prose or sentences would con be considered lower levels. And that said, you could oftentimes have a lower level character who's supposed to speak prose, let's say a laborer, speak in verse or poetry to show that they have a, an ability to reason that goes beyond their station. Or the opposite could happen where you have a higher level character like royalty who's supposed to be speaking in poetry all of a sudden is speaking in prose. Expect subplots in Shakespearean plays. So with Oedipus in the early days of drama, you've got basically one major story. With Shakespeare, we've got multiple stories. Even if they don't seem like they're related to one another, trust me, they are related to one another. So assume that everything has a connection. Shakespearean plays are divided into acts, and they're also divided into scenes and lines. This makes quotation actually infinitely easier because as you know, when we're quoting from a text, we usually refer to its page number and page numbers can vary based on the edition. But act scene and lines stay standard regardless of the edition that you happen to be reading. So you can refer to in the parenthetical documentation, the parentheses after the documentation, act, scene, and line. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about how to do that when um, we continue on with the play. And the play is confusing. Midsummer Night's Dream is supposed to be confusing because it's about love and the confusing nature of love. Um, Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy. And I wanted to lighten things up in this semester. We've been reading a lot of dark things. Shakespeare's probably best known for his tragedies, Hamlet, Beth, Othello, who are based on great men who experience downfall, in part because of outside forces, but also because of their own flaw or flaws in character. And if this sounds familiar, it should. It's based on the idea of tragedy and tragic hero that we discussed with Oedipus the King. But since so many of the pieces we've been reading are dark, I wanted to give us something a little bit more lighthearted. So a Shakespearean comedy. And Shakespeare wrote in genres, different kinds of plays, which in some ways is very formulaic. But Shakespeare broke all the rules. He could be formulaic, but still have great literature. Even though we would know that his plays could be divided into things like comedies which is what we're reading. And a comedy was mostly identified as a comedy because it was based on love and its misunderstandings. And then there was eventual resolution, a happy ending. So no death. And what a happy ending meant was marriage or at least the promise of marriage. You could also expect comedies to have humor, a lot of it physical humor. So it's important to actually see a comedy acted out. And a lot of music and dance that you miss when you're reading. It's thought that the comedies were oftentimes performed immediately before or after a wedding ceremony. So you wanted to keep that level of interest and lightheartedness um, in, in account when you were putting on a, commentary, uh, a play. But even the comedies, Shakespeare's most lighthearted, would have social and political commentary in them. They just, that social and political commentary just wouldn't be obvious. It would be more um, embedded within the text. So we're going to have to look for it. And the play Midsummer Night's Dream is included in your textbook, but I've also included a link below under the fifth section. You can see through uh, Shakespeare Folger EDU. The Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. is considered the premier Shakespearean library in the United States. And that said, you can probably find lots of versions of A Midsummer Night's Dream online. Um, one of the recommendations I usually give is to get a version of Shakespeare that has good um, end notes or footnotes, that's good some editorial commentary. Um, unfortunately, if you were to go on to the free link on the Folger, you get the play without the commentary, though, or the edit, the footnotes or end notes, though you could certainly purchase versions of the Folger and paperback where you can get that. Um, and that, that's usually considered to be one of the first go-to versions of Shakespeare. Um, but as I said, even the editors themselves are a little bit uncertain of the plays. Um, they're not even necessarily certain of the dates. So oftentimes you'll see a Shakespearean play with a date with a C, um, which means circa, which means around, um, which is for Midsummer Night's Dream, 1595. Um, Shakespeare's plays were also predictable in that you could guess what would happen at a particular time based on the act we were in. So it's a pyramid structure. So if you think about the pyramid and the lower end of the left hand side, that would be where act one is. This is where we're introduced to characters. And then we get the rising of the pyramid on the left hand side. That's where act two would be. And this is where we get the beginnings of conflict. At the tip of the pyramid, the top, the point, this is where we get Act 3, which is the height of conflict. And then on the right-hand side of the pyramid with the beginning of the descent is where we get Act 4, the beginning of resolution. And then finally, at the ending of the pyramid, Act 5, and that is resolution. A Midsummer Night's Dream is slightly different because it seems like the play is resolved after the fourth act. Um, and the fifth act seems superfluous, but trust me, nothing is superfluous in Shakespeare. There is a good reason why that fifth act is there, and it's a commentary on all of the other acts. The fifth act happens to be about a play that all the characters are watching. This is very common in Shakespeare to put a play within a play, and they serve as basically mirrors to one another, so you can expect that.
because the um, play is confusing, um, there's lots of plots and subplots, and again, love itself is confusing, I suggest that you keep a chart of all of the love relationships because basically you're going to see characters falling in and out of love with one another. They come from all different stations, um, labor to king and queen of not just humans, but the fairy world as well. So we're given a, a, a human world and a fairy world. Um, so this is a magical play of fantasy and both worlds will mirror one another to illustrate that no one is immune to the follies and the difficulties of love. You'll see younger people and older people fall in love You'll and out of love. You'll see different station, uh, uh, different um, levels of relationship from dating to engagement to already married. Um, regardless, all of these um, examples illustrate how love comes with complication and difficulty. But of course, since this is a comedy, we need to know that we have a happy ending coming up. So in terms of uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream and thinking about the, the, um, the plays and the writings Shakespeare would have done, he wrote other genres. Um, well, he wrote over 30 plays, and we think he spent mostly the beginning of his career writing comedies. He also wrote histories. We think those were the major bulk of his plays after the comedies. Based on British history, um, not just history in general, had to be on the history of Britain. And he would take artistic liberties based on the history that existed. Um, so it was an opportunity for Britain to revisit its history, but there would also be uh, dramatic changes that would be made. And they were usually about politics. And so you get all of the level of intrigue and subterfuge that you expect with politics. That's where my Shakespeare class is now, for instance, they're reading Richard II, uh, the first of the history plays. And we think that after the history, Shakespeare wrote his famous tragedies, probably what he's best known for. This would be the height of his career. Things like Hamlet and Macbeth and Othello and King Lear about great men experiencing dissent because of flaws and outside forces. So Shakespeare would use the definition of tragedy and tragic hero, but also change it to suit his artistic purposes. Um, not because he didn't know what the definition was, but because he wanted to do something a little bit different. Then we think Shakespeare ended his career by writing tragic comedies, which was a mix of genres, lots of darkness, like you would expect in the tragedies, expect lots of death in the tragedies, but also a happy ending, which is what you would expect in the comedies with music and dance. And we also know that Shakespeare wrote poems. This would be the time in which the theater, which I'm going to talk about shortly, would be closed because of plague. And it was thought that the plague was airborne, so they tried to close any large gatherings. And Shakespeare's poems are known as sonnets, which might sound familiar because we talked a little bit about sonnets when we were talking about a sorrowful woman. So we will revisit this actually when we get to the poetry section. So those theaters, of course, as you know, they are so important in terms of the way performance would have been done at the time. Shakespeare's theater is known as the Globe Theater or also the circular wooden O. It was a wooden structure that was made with wooden jointry and circular. Um, all of society attended. It was the television of the day, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, the noble and the peasant, everything in between. So there had to be lots of layers to the plays that would appeal to lots of different intellects and interests. And while going to the plays was considered to be a little lowbrow, Queen Elizabeth, the queen of the time, very much enjoyed going to the theater, thankfully, because she was a great supporter of the arts. It's one of the reasons probably why these plays still exist. Um, Again, the plays were seen as a bit lowbrow. Women were not allowed to perform in plays. The roles of females were played by young adolescent boys, which gives a very different sense to, well, uh, Romeo and Juliet, for instance. The costumes would be quite elaborate. Um, during the time of the Renaissance, clothing oftentimes denoted station, much more so than in contemporary times. So things like one station would dictate what colors one was allowed to wear or not wear or what kind of fabric. Um, there would be minimal props because props are difficult in terms of doing a live performance. You've got to move props on and off a stage. But 
Um, the theaters would be smaller than a Greek amphitheater, but you would see similar kind of seating where you would have a bleacher kind of seating with covered awnings. Those would be the more expensive seats because they would be covered because ultimately this was an open air theater. So they had to rely on natural light. Um, again, no electricity. And you could even rent a cushion, for instance, for one of these bleachers or seats or wooden seats to make yourself more comfortable if you have more means to do so. But of course, the theater was available to everyone so that if you couldn't afford some of these seats, well, what you could afford was to stand and watch a performance right in front of the stage. These people were known as groundlings because they stood on the ground. They were also known as stinkards because, again, hygiene left something to be desired at the time. And that said, Ironically, that might be the best seat in the house because you were right up close to the stage. And what's interesting about the Globe Theater, well, a couple of things that are interesting about it. The first theater, which was made with a thatched roof, burnt down, actually. Um, they did have, um, or they attempted to have special effects, things like fireworks and cannons, for instance. And a cannon was shot off during one of the performances and it caught the thatched roof on fire burn the theater to the ground, but they rebuilt this time with the tile roof. Now, at this point, eventually Queen Elizabeth and Shakespeare himself um, died. And if you remember the Puritans from young Goodman Brown, who thought everything was basically evil, especially if there was any enjoyment associated with it, definitely thought the theaters were evil and had the Globe Theater torn down. So there's no more Globe Theater except for a little plaque until about the 1970s when an American actor went on holiday to um, visit the Globe Theater and found that there was just a plaque there. He made it his lifelong mission to have that Globe Theater rebuilt. And despite all of the skepticism, he had no money, no political connections, and perhaps even worse, he was an American. And Britons couldn't believe how an American could do this, but somehow, some way he did. His name was Sam Wanamaker, and he was able to raise the funds and had the wherewithal to have the globe reconstructed. Unfortunately, he died shortly before its grand opening and its first performance. But you can see in the notes below, and this is in the third section about the Globe Theater, that there is a link so that you could see what the reconstructed Globe Theater looks like based on some of the um, cutting edge scholarship of the time. That would have been the 1990s. Since then, other scholarship has been uncovered that would suggest that it's not um, completely historically accurate, but it's pretty darn close with a few modern conveniences that I think everyone appreciates, such as, um, let's say, restrooms and such as, let's say, sprinklers. So, and you can even take a virtual tour of the Globe Theater, and I've included a link for that as well. So um, the Globe Theater obviously would have influenced the kind of performance that we would see. Uh, an interesting tidbit in that in the reconstructed Globe Theater where they perform Shakespeare's plays, both in their original, but also they try to modernize as well, that the hottest seat in town, so to speak, is to be a groundling, to stand right up close with the audience. And it was a rowdy experience at the time, um, almost like seeing a sports game, not the kind of gravitas that we put with watching a Shakespearean performance today. The audiences were quite vocal. If they didn't like what they saw, they would boo, they would hiss, they would even throw rotten food on the stage. Um, the plays or the theaters were known as places where pickpockets and prostitutes would frequent. So it was a very different kind of experience that you might be conceptualizing about a Shakespearean performance that would be done, let's say, in a contemporary opera house, let's say. Um, they were supposed to be fun. And I guess this is the challenge for modern day filmmakers with, uh, trying to adapt Shakespeare to make it accessible for modern audiences, audiences who might not have even read the play, and to make them fun. And the version that we are going to be watching of A Midsummer Night's Dream, I think does a pretty good job of this. Came out in the uh, 1990s with uh, Kevin Klein and Callista Flockhart. And um, 
that said, they took their liberties. Um, I'll talk a little bit. Well, actually, I can talk now a little bit about the production that we are going to be seeing. Um, one of the liberties they took was they modernized the dress into the Victorian period, the 1800s, a period that was known for lots of sexual repression. The idea of sexuality is a major theme in A Midsummer Night's Dream. So I think they wanted to give this sense of uh, sexual repression and how to fight against it in Midsummer. Um, the biggest issue I have with this production is they have the characters riding bicycles. Definitely not historically accurate, though it is quite visually appealing. They were able to film on location. I think that's one of the greatnesses of film is that you don't have to say constrained to a stage. So we have these wide expanses of Italy. Very common for Shakespeare to put his plays in exotic locales. Um, and But outside of the exotic locale, such as Athens, it may as well have been in Britain because everything else seems very British. And one of the characters, his name is Bottom, and I don't want to give too many spoilers, but in the video version or the film version we're going to be seeing, he's married. And the text itself, he's not married. And that's very, very important. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why when we actually talk about the play. So I very much wish they hadn't done that. But I think this version of Midsummer will give us something to consider, not just in terms of Shakespearean performance, but adaptation for contemporary audiences when we talk about film. Some suggestions I have for you when you are reading the plays, because again, watching a performance is never a substitute. It's merely a supplement to reading, is to read the plays out loud because they are meant to be heard. And what you might want to do is listen to an audio version of the plays. And there are several that are online in the GCC library. And there are many versions available of adaptations of Shakespearean plays. So, for instance, in my Shakespeare class, we see an adaptation that was done in the reconstructed Globe Theater. Um, it's not a particularly easy adaptation to get a hold of because of copyright issues. That's why I, I one of the reasons why I reserve it just for my Shakespeare class. The um, adaptation that I recommend if you want pretty much a word-for-word -word version of Shakespeare is the BBC version of any of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, the BBC um, had a very ambitious project in the 1970s and 80s to basically perform all of Shakespeare's plays as accurately as possible to the text which they did. And the good news is that all of those plays are available through the GCC library streaming service. So you could watch that if you wanted to and, and basically have a word for word translation. But again, for us as a literature and film class, I thought it would be most appropriate to watch a Hollywood film adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream and see how they went about going about doing that. So in terms of thinking about where we are, the paper that you would have submitted in to me at this point, I hope I have returned to you at this point. I try to spend spring break returning those papers to you. As you know that I had suggested that you could take an extension. It'll take me a little bit longer to get to those papers because now I've moved on to grading other papers in other classes. Um, but that said, um, if you haven't received your paper yet, you will be receiving your paper soon enough because I'm in the middle of the thing right now of evaluating papers. Um, so some of you might not have necessarily gotten a paper back even though you submitted it in by the deadline. But like as I said, I'm chugging away at it and um, you should be getting it sooner rather than later. And as you know that with the papers, um, I encourage you to do revisions and you get the higher of the two grades. So you're just taking my commentary into account as I reviewed for grammar and mechanics as well as for content for an A excellent B good, C satisfactory, and there are letters below that, a, a D less than satisfactory and an F unsatisfactory. And in the syllabus, it talks a little bit about the distinction between an excellent, which is an A, or a good, which is a B, or a C, which is a satisfactory, and so forth. 
And perhaps one of the bigger challenges you might have is reading my handwriting um, in terms of my commentary. So if that's the case, please reach out to me. Um, but regardless, you all have the option of doing a revision. If you're content with your grade, well, then you're done. But if you would like to do a revision, um, please take my comments into account. And if you need further direction, please reach out to me. And you get the higher of the two grades. I just ask that you submit in the original with my commentary along with your revision and you have up until the ending of the semester to do that but the sooner the better for everybody involved and ultimately again um, you won't necessarily have time to be writing a paper on um, on on um, uh, on all of all of the pieces that we'll be doing this semester um, you may um, probably see that we have a paper due for drama, but we don't necessarily have a paper due for uh, poetry. That said, you will have a final exam for poetry, so that's how we will put closure onto the class. So in terms of where we are right now with a Midsummer Night's Dream and today's class about Shakespeare for your attendance question, which would be due on the 27th, which is Wednesday. Um, and of course, if you need additional time, please let me know and I'll be happy to grant you an extension. What did you find to be the most interesting or surprising thing about Shakespeare from um, today's discussion and why? What did you find to be the most interesting or surprising thing about Shakespeare and why? So, uh, I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well, and I will also be catching up on your attendance form questions as well. Take care, and next class we'll talk about A Midsummer Night's Dream. Bye-bye.